Um, so yeah, my name's Claire, I'm a marine geoarchaeologist at Wessex Archaeology. And today I wanted to talk about the um, legacy of offshore development in the context of submerged landscape investigations. And it's really, I want to show you some of the lessons that we've learned from two recent offshore wind projects that we've been working on in the Southern North Sea. So I wasn't sure what the audience was going to be, but for those who are not um, that familiar with marine archaeology, I thought I'd give a bit of a background into submerged landscapes. Um, so essentially over the past two and a half million years, sea levels fluctuated from high points like we are today to low points. And it's during these low periods of sea level that the area that is the continental shelf essentially, quite shallow seas around northwest Europe, they become exposed as land and are suitable for human occupation. And they play quite an important role in migration pathways out of Europe into Britain. Um, so I think something that we often take for granted when we think, I mean, think about two and a half million years of history. Um, within the last million years, say, period of human history in Northwest Europe, about 90% of that time, sea levels are lower than today. So there's huge potential in the continental shelf in terms of submerged landscapes and the archaeology that might, they might contain. Um, so I've put up a picture here of Doggerland, because that's probably what everyone's most familiar with. Um, Doggerland is a sort of loose term that we use for the megalithic landscapes of the North Sea. But when we think about submerged landscapes, we're talking about much larger areas. If you think about the amount of land that's represented here, you know, it's areas that's comparable to the size of the UK. And we also look at much longer time scales. So we're going back a million years to the sort of early Paleolithic. So it's quite a broad subject in terms of area, but also in terms of time. So why do we care about them? Um, this map here shows locations where archaeological materials have been dredged up from the North Sea. It's important to point out that these are all chance finds. So these aren't targeted studies. They've sort of been pulled up by fishing vessels or dredges. And the type of material that you can get is can range from a little clump of peat, a little peat deposit, you can get megafauna, so big mammoth skull here. You can see evidence of human activity in the form of actual remains. So this is a skull fragment that was pulled up offshore of Holland. Um, you can see how humans are using tools, how they're decorating their bones. So there's a lot of evidence out there of human activity. And in the absence of finding these sites or finding that material, which is extremely difficult given the size of the area we're looking at, we use the submerged landscapes to give us an environmental context to human history and how that relates with the environment through time. So basically, they're heritage assets. So most people in marine archaeology often think of the shipwrecks because they're the sort of nice fancy ones that we can look at. But submerged landscapes also need to be considered. So how do we find them? Um, we do our best, our, our sort of main method at the moment is to take what we know about where we find archaeology on land in terms of what deposits is archaeology associated with, what environment are associated with, basically try to find those offshore. Um, it's a bit of a coarse method, but if we take this example here, it's a riverbank, we've got human activity along the margins, and um, so there might be some artefacts there, some st uh, tools left behind, and you know, on land we quite often find stone, stone tools associated with river terrace deposits. And we also have wetland, sort of marshy, boggy environments along the side of the rivers. So they create peat, and peat is perfect for preserving paleo-environmental material. So our, oh, our get, overall goal is basically to find these contexts offshore. Now that's a bit tricky. Um, it, well, it's not easy at all. I've put up an image here. So this map is the British Geological Survey's map of quaternary deposits, so that's the equivalent of superficial onshore, um, so that's about two and a half million years old. And you can see, for a start, you know, they have huge areas that are lumped together as the same deposit. And this yellowy-orange colour here, that's actually undifferentiated. They haven't defined it in terms of lithology, its composition, its age. So how do we find something like a river channel or a peat deposit? use an existing legacy data from the BGS when that's what we've got. So the main problem is really that the data that exists is just not good enough for the scale of submerged landscape reconstructions. And that's recognised in Historic England on their website. They say there is a need for large scale offshore characterisation projects and even within research frameworks, so the one for East of England, 
states further work is required on mapping and characterising the seabed resource. So we know we need to map it. Um, so what has been done historically to try and as a solution to that? I think that I think the best sort of project that I can well that it still stands today in the UK is the Marine Aggregate Levy Sustainability Fund. And um, so this was a project, a fund that was set up in response to marine aggregate dredging offshore, and collectively. They raised £25 million that they invested in some small-scale projects, but the ones that I think were key was the Regional Environmental Characterisation Projects. So they're often called RECs. And they were done for four key areas. One of them was the Humber, then there was East Coast, um, Thames, just offshore the Thames, and the English Channel. And what that did for this first time is it got a lot of different disciplines together to give us a baseline knowledge of what the environment is in these areas. And one of those things that they looked at was submerged landscapes. So there was a lot of data collected, um, there was a lot of paleo-environmental work, some dates were required. And I think these, even though this project finished sort of 10 years ago, this is still the best legacy I think we've got in terms of submerged landscapes at the moment, at least publicly accessible legacy. So, in the last 10 years since the end of the Aggregate Levy Sustainability um, Fund, we've still been carrying on with our submerged landscape assessments, but this we've been doing it through developer-led assessments in relation to mainly round two and round three offshore wind farms. So I've just put some of the wind farms up there relative to the REC areas. And I think the key is about this is with the shift to round threes, the scale of the project got so much larger, so there really is a need for that regional characterization and if you put a few license areas together you start to get areas that are sort of comparable to the RECs and another point from this is even though these are offshore they are just roughly I mean down here is a bit different but they're extended beyond the range of the RECs but there's also cable routes associated with these offshore wind farms so what they allow us to do is to take our knowledge of what we have offshore and link it to onshore So I thought I'd just go through some of the data types because we're talking about the legacy of offshore development. So I think the main data is not really archaeological data. So a lot of the developers collect a huge suite of geophysical mainly data, but also geotechnical, and that can include multi-beam bathymetry, which gives us an image of the seafloor and what it's shaped like, commonly used to detect wrecks, and wrecks squeezed in there. I didn't, didn't mean for that to happen. But, but we, we also have... Images, images of, of the, the subsurface, subsurface. So, so we're looking, looking for deposits and changes in them. This is a paleo channel here that we can see. And, and then obviously, obviously geophysics is a bit rubbish, rubbish. if you don't go along and get an actual sample. So we've got geotechnical data. data. Now, that, that is collected for many reasons, reasons and it's similar, similar to what Peter was saying, you know, collect what's used many times. Developers are not going to collect different data sets with different users. Um, and, and there are issues about commercial sensitivity with this, at least at the pre-consent stage. So getting, getting this data, data out there as that the discussion that we just had after Peter's talk was saying it can take a bit of time and it can be a little bit tricky. But there is some data that's collected just because of the archaeological assessment process. And that can be, we can create maps of landforms, so we're looking for things like rivers, um, any raised features like dunes. We can create deposit models, which uses the geotechnical data. That's quite similar to what we do on land just at a different scale, and, and we, we take, take it to the next step, step and that's where we get the paleo-environmental data, things like pollen, forearms, ostracods, plant, plant macrofossils, and we date that, and um, date those sediments as well. And all of that can be integrated together to give, give us the landscape reconstruction and the paleo-geographic mass, and, 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 and that's the sort of big scale picture that provides us the context to understand human activity. So, so I, think I think there is a huge amount of data collected. I mean, Louise last night was talking to somebody about the size of these data sets. You know, like they're in the scale of terabytes. They can be five, six terabytes. And it's not, it's not five terabytes of a single data. There's thousands of files within that. So it's a huge amount of information being collected. But the question is, is it accessible? And, and Peter and the discussion have basically done this slide for me. So thank you for that. Um, but, but it comes, comes back, back to this, you know, where the data is stored, how we access it. I think, I think it is accessible, but you've got to know where to look. look. And I think with the complexity of different data types, being, different data types being in different 
archive centres and do you access it through ADS, do you access it through the Crown Estate website? It's a bit, it's a bit tricky, but in principle, yes, the data is there if you know where to look. But one of the things that I find, at least, you know, when I work on a project and I look at the legacy of other projects to try and help me out, it's but the format that the data is in, it's often a lot of technical reports written in a technical language. You're piecing them together, you're trying to make sure you don't miss anything. And technically, it's accessible, that information is accessible, but it's not very user-friendly. It's certainly not user-friendly if you're a non-specialist. So I think there's a bit of a shortcoming there. And another point that was raised in the discussion is the link between the planning and the development process and the data in terms of if the development stops, what happens to the data? There can be lag times between when things are collected and when they're ultimately archived at the end of the project. And that can be 10 years. So there's a few issues, but yes, the data is technically accessible. Right, so moving on to the fun data. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Fatten4. Fatten4 are the developer in this case, and there are two wind farms. There's Norfolk Vanguard, which comprises west and east, and then there's Norfolk Boreas. And the reason this is of interest to us is it's in quite a shallow part of the Southern North Sea, um, in Dogland, essentially. And it's quite close to sort of Haysbrook Hakefield, key early Paleolithic sites, and also Area 240, which is the dredging site where they pulled up, I think you can use your hospital, maybe it's 88 stones, or okay, up to 132, and that's in the middle of the Paleolithic site. So, there is potential in the area. Um, another point is the onshore offshore cable route comes and onshore at landfall at Haysbury. So we spend quite a lot of time carefully considering the archaeology. So, big sites. I had a little Google of how big Leeds was last night. Google says it's 550 square kilometres. So if you look at the scale of these, 724, this is the whole area is about three times the size of Leeds. And within, within that, we have full coverage of multi beam telemetry. And um, so, you know, the investment and the time take, it takes to acquire that data is insane. We have full coverage of seismic data, which is geophysics, that's the one that images the subsurface. And we have, I think, a pretty decent number of high calls um, for each of the sites. So, what we, we do, our assessment process, this is generally pre consent as part of the environmental impact assessment. We've got to go out there, we BGS maps aren't really good enough to tell us what deposits are there or where they are. So we go out, we characterise the seabed, shallow surface, and we're trying to find those deposits that are going to be of archaeological interest. So some of the results, some thought about well, I'd love to talk about the results themselves and what they mean in terms of archaeology, but I'm focusing more on the legacy today. But I did squeeze some of them in. So this is a map from geophysics. I hope that the colours show up well enough. But this big huge area of green here and through, and through the green you can just about see little snippets of blue channels so what we have is a huge area of peat dissected by a number of paleo channels and this system i've measured some systems on land and um, it's comparable to the size of the river mersey and i didn't pick that river because i'm from liverpool but that was the first one that came to mind so it's a big river system big landscape huge amount of peat um, usually, when we do offshore assessments, we might have single core with a peat deposit in it. And we don't have the wider context for that peat, we might have dates from it, but we can't link it to, say, what's next door. But in this environment, such a huge area of peat. And we've, really got, we've got other little treasures, like we've got some buried dunes that are immaculately preserved. Um, and they could be related to a former coastline, a lake shoreline. So, so we, we do have our paleo landscapes out there. But I suppose the question is here. So these are two separate sites um, treated differently in the EIA process and going through planning and everything. Can we use information like this from one site to predict or at least have a bit of an estimate of what we might expect in another site? That would be the ideal. Um, in some ways, yes. So similar assessment was carried out for the adjacent North of Berea site. Here's all this peat again, and some paleo channels, similar scale. So what I always think is we often focus so much on the site, but we need to think that the, the site is a landscape, and the landscapes don't have boundaries. So we need to put it into a broader context. And what this type of assessment allows us to do is to make that link. 
And it's only possible here because it's the same developer and Wessex is the same contractor. The situation where you've got different developers or the process is at different stages, you know, so you might do your assessment here and five years later you do it here. It's a bit more tricky, but I think I think this demonstrates that we do need to think much bigger picture going back to that regional characterization of landscapes. And we can make an estimate based on this. The peak seems to be north of roughly this line. So we know from our work that there's an elevation control and there is, by comparing that elevation to sea level, we can predict where peak will be and where peak won't be. And it's proved because when we look at the site of the south, there's no peak whatsoever. So the point of this is if we can, in some way, sort of go away from our site-specific view, maybe collaborate, be transparent, make the data released possibly early on in the process, we can get this information out there so that we can design better mitigation strategies for all the sites that are adjacent to nearby. So, so that's essentially, as I was saying earlier, if you consider the scale of these sites, those areas are comparable to the regional environmental characterization schemes. So we've done that first step, let's go characterise the deposits. We know where they are. We know roughly what they are with the rain boreholes that we've got in the area. So the next stage is now we can start asking more important questions, which, you know, how old are the deposits? Is there evidence preserved in the deposits? Is there evidence of human activity? And that allows us to develop research strategies that are driven by questions that are targeted instead of let's just go back to some landscapes. So we had a lot of research questions. The potential in these two sites was quite amazing. But just thought I'd focus on the what are the age of the deposits. And mainly looking at this huge vast area of peat, which I think I put on the previous slide, 85 square kilometres. Um, so chronology, extremely important. And this kind of comes back to legacy. So this is work that was commissioned by Historic England about 10 years ago, and it was a database, get a database together of peak deposits that we have radiocarbon dated. And all the little red dots just show the locations where we have that information. It is extremely restricted to the intertidal and coastal areas. There is three points offshore. This was 10, well, four, I forgot about that one. This was done 10 years ago. The work that we did for the offshore wind farms, we acquired 17 new radiocarbon dates. Um, collectively, we have three and a half years of landscape development, um, and we're able to date when the landscape is flooded. So that's quite significant results. But how are we getting those results out there? Are they just buried in a report that you find through a Medan search or through the Crown Estate search? I think. It just highlights that, you know, databases like this are excellent if they're constantly updated. And we can't, they don't need to be live documents because that's quite tricky. Um, but at least routinely we should be making sure that all of this information from offshore wind is getting fed into reviews like this. Because, yeah, 10 years out of date. And, you know, this is only, I'm only showing you results from two wind farms here. And there's, you know, there's five to ten wind farms of this scale that are being assessed at the moment to roughly at this scale. So one other thing we can do, um, our aim is to sort of find where these landscapes are. So this is a paleogeographic model based on sea level data. Um, it's done by Fraser State at Southampton. And this is the one where we can start to rise sea level and flood the North Sea. And in principle, we can use it to predict where we might find landscapes. But the issue has always been we've got no information to test the model. We don't know if the model's right, essentially. And with the information that we pulled out from these wind farms, because we've got so many radiocarbon dates and we have sea level context for them, we can then feed this information into models, refine them to a higher resolution, because this is quite a coarse resolution at the moment. And we can use that to target where other sites will be. So it, rather than just this is game comes back, let's not just bury it in the report. So let's take that next step to try and improve the process and really make the most of the legacy that has been created from offshore wind. And then just one final point. Um, I think earlier on, on the geophysical maps, there's big areas of brown. That's a deposit called Brown Bank, which is a bit, it's a bit curious, really. Uh, BGS have mapped it. It is about... A thousand square kilometres covers much of the sort of 
to the North Sea or North Bay. And the problem with, that's not really a problem with Brown Bank, but there's been a lot of fines associated with Brown Bank, um, but they're generally mesolithic in age. At the same time, BGS Mac Brown Bank as being sort of the late early to early middle Paleolithic age, which differs to what the artefacts age is. Um, apparently Brown Bank was deposited during a period when humans were absent from Britain. Um, work done by Louise and colleagues in Area 240, which was that aggregate area, shows that Brown Bank is actually a lot younger than we once thought, and it corresponds to a period when humans roughly reappear, reappear in Britain. So how do we, as archaeologists, how do we assess the potential of that deposit? You know, is that something that is worth investigating, or is it something that's not of interest because maybe it's a marine deposit, or it's from a period that we're not interested in because humans weren't present in Britain? Um, essentially, I can't, I can't spend too much time on the results, but the work that we've done by producing quite high-resolution chronology for this, using optical stimulated luminescence dating, combined with paleo-environmental results, we're in a position where we can reappraise this deposit in terms of its environmental history and its age, and we essentially reassess its archaeological potential. But how do we get that information out? How does anybody else learn from that, again, if it's just buried in a report? And I think it's particularly important, because these are the three green farm sites we're working on here, but you know, there are other sites that have these deposits in them. So they're run by different developers. Um, how we get that information to them? I think that's a good question. Again, it comes back to collaboration and being open and transparent and making sure the results get out there. So, one final point. I thought that was the last one. Something that we did for the first time on these projects is we, we tried to utilise all available data. So I said earlier on that the geophysical data is collected for multiple purposes, and one of those is engineering. So for the developer, understanding the structure of the ground so that they know where to put different foundations is quite key. So they invest probably, I mean, it's groups of, it could be a group of five people over a period of one or two years working solidly full-time building up a ground model, which is essentially a super deposit model. They focus on the strength of the deposits, whereas archaeologists were interested in the environmental history, but occasionally we're both interested in the same information. And it, in this case, I'm talking about brown bank, so I put a seismic up and they're always rubbish to show on presentations, I'm afraid. But the process is essentially you look for contacts between different deposits, you map them, and from that you can pull out the elevation of that deposit, and you're essentially subtracting everything that's above it and you're pulling out the paleo land surface, or sea surface if it was sea at the time. So Fugro did that for the ground model, by collaborating with them and seeing the potential in others' interpretations, they provided us with the surfaces, um, which are essentially digital terrain models of a period in the past. Um, here it just shows the two models for the site. Unfortunately, one wasn't produced for this site. So grounds are high ground, if you imagine this is land, blues are lower ground. So what we can do with this information is, we know sea level history, so we can apply scenarios to it. We take points in time using our chronology that we have from OSL dating, and we build up a picture of what the geography of the landscape was. So this is a period when sea level was quite low in the past. We have some land here in the north. The yellows represent sort of shallow intertidal areas. You can see features like islands. Is this some sort of barrier island? Is there a lagoon behind it? You know, over here, is this an estuary? We compare that to the paleo environmental data, um, which actually in some cases does confirm what we see here in the geography. So this is getting to the point where we start bringing everything together to build up that big landscape picture. And we can, this is just another scenario where we rise, we raise sea level, we flood the landscape. And by using models like this, we can come up with different sort of hypothetical situations about where we might find evidence of human activity. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of warrant in stepping outside of our sort of archaeology bubble and working a lot more closely with the engineers and geologists. So just four key points really of the lessons we learned from this. It's that taking, this, taking it beyond the site view, looking at the bigger context, 
can we improve our predictive capability? But for that, it does require collaboration and transparency, and that can be difficult given commercial sensitivity, and I don't necessarily know the solution to that. Um, another one is we build up these big regional scale characterizations that are needed because we just don't have the data um, to make any you know, fair assessment of submerged landscapes. That helps us change our strategy, and we're looking more at the human side, because everyone will always say, yeah, but there's still no archaeology, where's your sites? We can't get to that unless we start with the big picture and then slowly start to narrow it down. The other thing is we completely change our understanding of different deposits. We reappraise them. We don't just take as is from 10, 20 years ago. And, you know, we need to keep things active and keep things improving. And then the final one is, yeah, we've got to work collaboratively with other disciplines. They might be doing something that we can just tweak a little bit and, you know, we can use it for submerged landscape reconstructions. So I suppose the big question is, is, is the legacy of submerged landscape assessments good enough? I think yes, in terms of data production, it is insane and the investment that's going into it. But where we fall short is getting it beyond that. It's just a bunch of data that nobody can really get or it's in formats that are not necessarily um, very accessible or easy for people to understand. You know, at, at a single site scale, you might get your eye in and understand it. But it's how do we link one site to another, to another, to another. It's building that big picture of what the sort of Southern North Sea landscapes look like using all the offshore development legacy data. And in terms of going forward, I think Louise mentioned round four possible extensions to round three wind farms. We don't quite know where the areas are just yet, but they're roughly going to be in these areas. So essentially, we need to make sure that all of that data that we've collected as part of the round three. We're at a stage now where we bring it all together, update our baseline knowledge. Let's not rely on something that was done 10 years ago. We shouldn't be going back to marine ALSF, um, the regional environmental characterizations. We should be building on them. Let's not just waste the last 10 years of work. Um, again, all of those outputs, we need to make sure they come back into the planning process. So we're not just going out mapping for the sake of mapping. And I think the final point is, I do think we're a, we have an opportunity from offshore developments to create a similar, if not better, legacy than that was done for the aggregate sector. So I really think that that's the way we should be going. Um, we we can make a change with what we've got here. There's you know multi million pounds worth of investment. We can't let that go to waste. I just thought I'd end with one final slide. I was thinking about what the legacy might look like. Recently, I think it was last week, um, EMODnet, which is a Euro European Marine Observation Data Network, it's a collaboration between different countries that brings data together. They have been working on a submerged landscape work package for two years, and they just released the data last week through this portal. And one thing that shot to my mind straight away was, look at the east, east coast of Britain, where all the wind farm developments are. There's no data in there. so. This is already outdated. Um, this is probably the state of play 10 years ago because we haven't got all of that information from offshore development out into the public sector yet. So I suppose the goal would be to fill in these blanks with all the work that we've been doing recently. And that's me. Thank you for your time.